Well, good afternoon and thank you for joining me. And hopefully you've had an interesting time so far in all the other breakout sessions. I've got about 20 minutes today to talk to you about foresight from insights. And we're going to do a little more of this tomorrow. What I am really getting into is how to look at what is going on in the global meat industry and, and how you can use that to read ahead to understand the challenges that we all face. And it's a fascinating time at the moment. I mean, I've never seen a time in, in 18 years in the industry where there is so much disruption in, in different directions and pull on supply. So a great time to be thinking about these things. Now, I come from JIRA. JIRA is a European-based consultancy company specializing in the food supply chain. And we've got consultants and analysts and specialists all around the world who feed into our network on a, on a daily basis. And we pick up and, and follow these trends annually, and we've been doing it now for 50 years. So it's really interesting. I've been with the company for 18 years, and I, I have never seen a period like this. So to do what I'd like to do today, I'm going to break the session into four parts. The first part of this is to just have a quick look at the global situation. And we can't go into, into real detail, but just enough to understand what we're looking for. Then I want to talk a bit about the COVID impact. It's impossible to get away from this. And then to step back and, and think pre-COVID, what were we fascinated by? And we were fascinated by what was going on in China and ASF and the impact of that is still there and will run into the midterm. And then I'll leave you with some final thoughts. So the 2020 global situation, this is where we were forecasting as we came out of last year. And there are a couple of things to bear in mind. We've broken this out by species. So beef here in red, uh, this one down here is shoat, which is sheep and goat the pink of pork and the yellow of poultry. And really, the focus wants to be on the, the pork and the, the poultry signals at the moment, because that's where the biggest movements are. Beef, you can see, has been growing slightly over the years, but was down in 2020, largely because of the COVID impact on buffalo production in India. But also, we've got the drought impacts of Australia and the rebuilding of their herd. We've got changes in the cattle cycle in Brazil and the US and other things going on. But back to growth in 2021 as some of those cattle that didn't make it forward for slaughter because of COVID disruption around the world come forward and because demand starts to recover. Sheep and goat continue to grow at a, a sort of one, one and a half percent per annum. And that's down to a large share of that coming from uh, poorer production systems around the world, notably Africa, India, across Asia. Whereas the big trade drivers remain New Zealand, Australia, and then the European intra-trade. Intra but the thing that, that we're fixating on here is this decline in pork. And this happens pre-COVID. This is ASF in China spreading in 2018. So we don't see the decline there. We were then really talking about the change in price in 2019 of pork. And we see that that continues in 2020. We're short somewhere around 24 million tons of pork in China. But then you've got to factor in that we've got massive losses in Vietnam, substantial disruption in the Philippines, which is still spreading some disruption in Korea, further risk in, uh, in Thailand if it gets into Thailand, and also the disruption from trade as somewhere like Germany tests positive for ASF. So although we expect some recovery from this year in production, that's because China is getting to the bottom of its cycle, but it's not back to anything like where it was, and so the pull into China continues. COVID took the edge off this because demand just wasn't as significant as it should have been because COVID blunted that demand around the world. So it took the price pressure off a bit. In poultry, you see that long-term growth trend that we've seen the expansion of broiler chicken around the world suddenly flattens in 2020. This was a year we were expecting really good growth. The reality though, is that because of COVID, chicken demand just plateaued and there was production kept coming through. So we see a little bit of growth, 0.7% globally, the reality is that prices fell because there was too much chicken in the market for demand, except for China. China continued to buy off the world market. And so China kept price, prices higher than they would have been. If we had COVID without ASF in China, the price situation would have been very different. We go back into growth this year. The expectation is that food service around the world will start to open up. It's not a perfect outlook. We're not expecting it to be. You know, it, here in Europe, we're at the end of the first quarter and we're going back into lockdown in a number of countries because COVID is spreading again. So disruption continues to, to be the story of the year from COVID. And that's really what I want to talk about in this first bit is, is how to read this. And so 
we've all seen, I, I should think, hundreds of these COVID curves. I find them really useful to, to read and not maybe at this scale, but if you look at a country level and try and understand what is going on at that country as you see the daily case number change. The thing about this graph is it shows that we're in a, at least a third wave, in some countries a fourth wave of COVID at the moment. And the one that's cropping up at the moment, Europe down here in yellow, you can see it expanding rapidly. And if I was to write up the data, it would be more serious than it is. As that happens, and it doesn't matter which country you're in, food service closes down, either because the government shuts it or because consumers don't want to go out. They're worried, they stay home, and therefore food service demand moves to retail. It's not the same. Retail doesn't completely make up for the loss of food service, but it helps counter it. The cuts bought at retail are different. People don't know how to cook the same products at home, although notably through 2020, we saw some of that change. The key is that around the world, we've been through a very difficult end to 2020 with COVID. We've had a slightly quieter period in the last couple of months, except for in the, the UK, and now it's on the rise again, very notably in Europe. But there is a vaccination program in the wealthier countries, and we would expect to see that roll out around the world. The expectation is that COVID disruption persists through 2021, but at a lower level than we saw um, through last year. And here, this just shows um, the food service disruption as we look through the year. And so the blue is China, the green is the US, and the yellow is the EU 27 plus UK. And notably, China's disruption, real, the real point of it came in Q1 2020, down, we thought about 43%, whereas in Europe and the US, it comes in Q2, COVID arrived later. There they were down, between 44 and 50%. Notably, there's a recovery in the, in the third quarter. As the summer was better, there was less COVID, people went out. And then we've been back into it. There's been a difficult winter. And now the forecast is that as we look through 2021, we're not expecting food service to get back to where it was in 2019. In Europe and the US, we're expecting it to be still around 20% lower. That's massive. That changes eating habits. And then in China, we're back into growth. We're back up above 2019 levels and ongoing. Very strong control program. Uh, the country's opened up for internal travel. COVID remains under control for now. The thing that does benefit is QSR. We've seen that in, in a number of countries. The takeaway businesses that have been able to either supply uh, collection points from the house or, or doorstep delivery have really benefited and chicken does notably well in that. So we know one of the, the gains in this has been chicken. The other thing to factor in is economic disruption and, and in every country it's different, but 2020 was bad everywhere from an economic point of view, except for really Vietnam and China. And even there you can see plus 1.9% in China and plus two and a half percent in Vietnam it was a bad year for those countries. Everywhere else we're really talking negative numbers. That means consumers are being more careful about what they spend. They're more concerned about disposable income. They can't eat out though. They can't go out and, and socialize. And so actually those that have still got work have managed to keep money in their pockets. And they've got some pent up spending power that we would hope to see released in 2021. For many others, uncertainty is the name of the game. When will government job retention schemes where they exist stop? When will some of the money that's been uh, available for those that are unemployed run out? And so, although we look better in 2021, the reality is it's still a very bad year compared to where we should be. We're not back up to 2019 levels in terms of disposable incomes and uncertainty persists around the world. And so my big message, economic uncertainty is huge. You, you cannot underplay this. This sees consumers down trading from quality steak to beef mince, uh, from beef to chicken and pork and from chicken down into eggs and then vegetables. And so we have to be aware that the global market is looking for less meat and they're prepared to pay less for it at the moment. And that's really important as we factor in what the markets are doing. An array of things, and, I, and this is where we're looking for insight. We're, we're trying to understand what the things are that influence our market. And so for me, the two big ones are COVID and ASF at the moment on the global market, and then their cascading effect. And so we know that from COVID, we've had a ban on travel. Uh, we haven't seen tourists around the world. Somewhere like Thailand that has a high number of tourists or Singapore have really suffered. The businesses that buy premium meat products are not buying the products that they would normally because that tourist demand isn't there for it. 
And we can magnify that around the world, that, that demand is struggling. We've seen food service shuttle disrupted, numbers reduced, even if it's open, the seating capacities are cut. You know, what is viable and what isn't? And, and then as you look into the supply chain, the wholesalers that put product into those restaurants, is their business still viable at the moment? What, are, what have been their losses over the last year? What's been the waste agent and what's going to survive as we look into the year ahead? We have to factor these in. Companies that have successfully moved to doorstep delivery. An e-commerce platform is amazing. With the growth in e-commerce this year, yes, a little bit of it will step back as people can go and eat out. But a lot of that will hold on. And the companies that have been early adopters that have that technology in place as COVID came will be some of the winners. Trade. Trade is one that just continues to get more complicated, especially sea freight. And we know that, you know, particularly notable in the news in the last couple of weeks, uh, the Suez Canal blockage, but also the, the backlog getting into US ports with not enough freight capacity to get ships in there at the moment. And freight rates have gone up. The non-reefer rate is something like tripled at the moment into the US ports. Uh, that backlog is causing further delays. We've got to think about what this means to the demand capacity of our markets. Then SDG goals, sustainable development, adding cost complexity. Do the consumers understand these even? What is it they're asking for? Is there a way that we can market these products with these added qualities? And how do we represent that? Avian influenza, we certainly had a worse year than we've seen for a while. It's complicated. There is more of it around than there has been. And again, look for the disruption. Feed price is a massive one. Feed price is up. In some markets, three times the level they were in the middle of last year. That cost has to be passed through to the consumer at a time when the consumer's got less disposable income. We're going to force them to reduce the volume that they consume in many markets because we've got to put the prices up. And in the middle, the meat companies are being really pinched. They, they're finding it hard to, to push through this cost and therefore margins are going negative. We're talking about losses in a number of big export markets. And then right here in the middle, cash. How much liquidity is, in there, is there in the system? And we know small producers need to generate that cash turnover. And if they can't do it, their businesses fail. So we're looking at that and wondering up and down the chain how much disruption we're going to see. A little note on feed prices, and this is just to give you a little perspective. They've been remarkably flat since 2014 through this period to the middle of 2020 when they went very low because of COVID disruption and uncertainty. And then suddenly they boom. China is largely to blame, not entirely, but very largely. ASF meant a move to more commercial feed as the pigs stopped eating swill. And we saw the, the emphasis of pig production moving to big commercial farms. The reality is they are still very short of pigs. They're going to need more. The thing that really caused the crisis, full army worm and several serious um, harvest issues. Uh, you know, floods, typhoons, those kind of things. They've then reached into the world market and bought large amounts off the world market to make sure that they've got stocks to produce meat domestically. Will, will they persist? Will China have a better harvest? If it does, these prices will come back down. But no, they are not as high as they were through the crisis of 11, 12 and 2013. But this is still a level at the moment that the market is finding it hard to sustain. Shipping rates. I've really been into these. The world is dependent on being able to move products around by reefers. We are short of refrigerated containers at the moment. We're short of non-refrigerated containers at the moment. We're finding it very difficult to get them back to where they need to be to be refilled. The net result is the costs are skyrocketing. They are likely to stay high through the rest of this year. And the industry needs to factor in it, not just that it's much more expensive, but that it's become a little unreliable, the time frame. So if you're getting something just in time, now you need to make sure that you're holding some stock, maybe two or three weeks worth, just to be sure that you're going to get the next shipment before you run out. The notable air freight rates have also gone up as well. China, we keep coming back to China. It's, it's to blame for a lot of this. And ASF is the problem, not China itself. Huge boom in prices. And so just to show you what's going on quickly in the prices, this, this shows the price at three different levels. Uh, we gather them on a weekly basis. We put them monthly here just to give you something you can, you can actually see. The blue line is the piglet price. The red line is the one you want to keep an eye on, the pork retail price. Normally, it's managed under 30 RMB a kilo, the Chinese published price. And we get these from a variety of provinces. 
If it goes above that, the Chinese government interact, push the price back down. If it comes below 20, then we see a number of measures are brought in to encourage producers and get the prices back up a little bit. They want to encourage production, but they want to make sure they have affordable food. With ASF, the price didn't just go through 30 or 40, but it hit 60 RMB a kilo. That makes it unaffordable for most consumers in China. It pushed people to go to chicken, but there wasn't enough chicken. It pushed the, the government to reach out into world markets and import. And so what we saw through 2019 and 20 was the Chinese industry the reaching into the world market and buying not just pork, but buying chicken and beef in increased volumes at higher prices. So while the rest of the world in 2020 didn't want so much meat, China was buying it. It held those world prices up. So that was probably just as well. You can see at the moment the prices have come down and then they've gone up. And so one of the things I, I struggle with is, is people come to me and say, look, Chinese prices come back down. China's fixed its pork supply problem. The price signal, which is probably the best signal in China at the moment, tells us that it hasn't. The price is still well above 40. In fact, a lot of the time it's above 50 RMB a kilo. That is not a China that has fixed its supply problem. That is a China that's looking for supply. But we have these periodic shifts because you've got a lot of unpredictability. They get new surges of ASF and other problems. So read the Chinese price lines. In terms of what's it meant in global trade, I'm not going to get lost in the detail. The EU is the blue at the bottom here. A really big shipper, but they've just lost, well, as of September 2020, Germany gets banned not just from shipping to China, but also Japan and Korea and the Philippines can still ship though to Vietnam because of ASF in, in Germany. So that changes the supply picture for Spain, perhaps, and a number of the other exporters who are able to take advantage of the gap left by Germany in the Chinese market and the others. But a huge step up. If we came back to 2018 and we're a product weight here, you can see we're just over a million tons going into China on an annual basis. Last year, we were nearly four and a half million tons of, of pork, not including offal going into the market. That has to come from somewhere. It didn't come from the huge increase in production. It was mainly robbed off other markets. So China is the disruptor and we expect that to continue in 2021, but it will fade towards 2025. Sea volumes are still high in 2025, but they're way down on the peaks. The disruption is going to reduce. The global price of pork will fall as a result. Okay, a few final thoughts just to, to leave you with. Um, it's been a really difficult year globally. Wherever you are, you're not alone. The disruption uh, has reached every sector of the meat industry. And it's a balance of the factors of COVID and the factors of ASF. And clear that there is supply stress all over the, the market and it's not about to go away. COVID-19 is the disruptor today, but it's short term. That's the thing to remember. As we go through 2021, the impact will ease. It will certainly last into 2022 and quite likely 2023 in terms of economic disruption, the way that travel has changed, the disruption for tourism. But it's fading. And so we've got to start to factor in what the other problems are. Chinese buying is, is a major force on the market. It's pricing other lower income markets out. It's making uh, exporters think, you know, do I send something to the Philippines or do I get the higher price in China? They're favoring China by and large. COVID-19 impact on economies is reduced demand. So the shortage hasn't been as apparent as it would have been without COVID. Chinese demand is going to remain very strong in 2021 as pork supply shortfall will last until at least 2025. And we're seeing, we're all seeing these mega projects huge farms being built that are completely integrated sow to, to slaughter units. But they can't fill the gap instantly. It takes time, not just to build them, but to stock them and to get them working. It increases the price of all meat, reduces availability globally, and it's changing the, the flexibility of exporters who might at one time have accommodated your, your desires, but now they're less likely to because the price is better in China. They don't have to do so much at the moment to keep China satisfied. And so they're focusing there. Likely, though, that China reduces imports from 2023 to 25. That's really important. It will increase availability on the global market. And it means that prices will fall. OK, they were not talking about them going all the way back down to 2018 levels, perhaps, but certainly more palatable than they are today. Not just pork for everything. Chicken is likely to fall before that. ASF is a major long-term industry chain. 
changer. I mean, it really is uh, disrupting the flow of the industry. It's forcing out small commercial producers in countries where there is ASF, and that's really notable across Asia. And it's rising prices and encouraging investment. We are going to, in Asia, once this is settled out and moved from this hybrid model where we've got commercial production and we've got lots of backyard farms and small commercial operators to a more integrated commercial operation that can manage the risk of ASF. That's a necessity. If a vaccine was available commercially and it worked within the next six months, then that would slow that rate down. We were going there anyway. The reality is a vaccine is unlikely in the next 18 months, but not impossible within two years. By then, I think it will be too late. Many of those small commercial farms will have gone and done something else because they cannot wait two years doing nothing. So lots of things. I think it's helpful to, to be able to factor all those in. I'm sorry we can't go into all the detail that's, that's out there and, and worth discussing. I believe we've got time for a few questions. And I don't know whether you type those into the box or how the platform works. But if you have, it, it would be great to have them. Uh, otherwise, thank you for, for joining. And there'll be another session tomorrow. Great, Rupert, thank you so much. And I'd like to ask you to turn on your camera now as well. A really great presentation to finish off the day, some more hard da data, uh, something that, that maybe wakes up people <laughs> on, on certain global prices a bit. I'm um, wondering, uh, which a question that just came in, uh, and you just refer to China very often here, um, is the impact on, on price stability and uh, across different meets um, and throughout 2021 and moving forward. How do you foresee then the, the changes? Will it be every meet will be um, affected by the price fluctuations or do you think, think that there's one particular meet that will be harder affected than others? Yeah, look, it's a, it's, it's a really good string of questions and, and very clear that, that China is the problem at the moment in terms of the volume of meat that it's buying but it's come at an interesting time we've seen pork is is the species most affected by asf and so that's where the price is most acute at the moment and you can see that in the the movement in the us prices where we're four times the level they were this time last year pork producer prices but the reality is that last year they were in a hole because of asf uh because of covid in in the us but they've downsized their sow herd. So they've reduced production on the foot of them, you know, a very difficult year last year. At the same time, we've got very high feed prices globally. And that's most notable in chicken and pork prices because those two species are most intensive on their feed use. So the pull into China of, of chicken and pork is, is really driving the price up. The expectation is that it drives the price up throughout this year. Uh, I think as I, I hinted out there, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion that the Chinese have fixed their pork supply problem and they clearly haven't. And you can see that in some of the discussion going on at the moment, most notably in the price. Now the Chinese price has dipped a little bit at the moment because they've been culling with this second wave of, of ASF. But we know that that's gonna deepen the problem into the second half of the year. So expect pork prices to go up. The reality for everyone buying in the region is that China is taking more off the world market at a time when global supply just isn't increasing and therefore prices go up, there's more stress and you lose that ability to negotiate because of, you know, the, the producers, the exporters around the world have got that option of going to China. Now, that said, the, the really savvy exporters are looking at the immediate opportunity and saying we need to have a share of that. But also, they've got to look to the five year horizon when China pulls back. China will recover its pork supply, not all of it, but a large share. And then we're going to displace those volumes that go to China today. So the good exporters will go, we want some of it, but we need to keep long term connections. We need to build those bridges for further down the road. And, and that's the process we're into. That's what makes this year so interesting. Absolutely. I think you're hinting already to your second segment for tomorrow, which is looking at future growth and opportunities there in this global meat supply. So um, 
Can you give us a sneak peek what you're going to talk about tomorrow? Yeah, look, I mean, the, today's presentation was very much about setting up uh, things to look for in the market because it's all very well, you know, us providing forecasts fairly regularly to the market. But, but you need to react as things are happening in real time. So the idea of today was to go, look, here are the basics for what you should be looking for. Tomorrow, we want to talk about where the markets are going to help you prepare for the future, to understand how much meat might be available in the supply chain, the challenges that your businesses will face around the region uh, in terms of ability to buy off the world market. Who are you competing with? What might the price be doing? And a little bit about what is the consumer going to want? Because what's really interesting for me at the moment is, you know, in, in 18 years, we talked a lot about the European consumers leading the trends in, in what they need and expect and, and want the industry to develop, to, to deliver. In the last five years, we've seen the US has caught up remarkably fast. In fact, in things like antibiotics, they lead. And we've largely ignored the conversation across the Middle East, Asia, um, it's been it just hasn't been there. It's been a very price driven conversation, but actually that's changing. Um, and we see that led by the big brands, by food service and things. So tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about why is that really important to start to understand and why you should read ahead. OK, great. So thank you so much, Rupert. I, I would then invite everybody to join also tomorrow's session for Rupert, which is looking into the future. So it's a great bench uh, mark that we set today. So we're looking forward to hear more from you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. OK, I would uh, like then to um, wrap up the day and thank everybody for being part of the first day of FHA Match. We've had a wonderful set of speakers, a, a great uh, number of questions that came in and in, the integration of um, different polls were also quite helpful, I guess, for us to understand what you like to learn about tomorrow and going forward. So um, we want to really also thank again our sponsors of today. Um, we had MLA in the morning doing a fantastic presentation on their sustainability program and framework. Uh, equally, the Irish uh, Food Board um, with Malcolm to a really good insight of what's happening in Ireland currently and um, their push to go into the markets in Asia. So thank you so much for, for today's attention and we welcome you tomorrow morning uh, first thing and uh, we'll have a, a lot of things in, in stock for you, uh, including uh, trade talks, uh, trade experts that look at the uh, free trade agreements in Asia. We have an uh, exchange between the tourism, uh, sorry, the Singapore um, Ministry of Trade and the European Commission on the uh, free trade agreement between the two uh, entities um, um, and a lot of other really great uh, speakers that that look at leveraging your knowledge um, and being better prepared for anything that has to do with pressure on the meat market, including alternative protein. We're starting off the day with a segment um, on this. So uh, please, yeah, welcome. Uh, to see you tomorrow and uh, have a wonderful evening. I hope you met some great connections today. Thank you.